You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Good evening, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson on my show, Author to Author. I am with my two friends, Kiki Latimer and with Steve Schwartz, and we're going to discuss his book, Philosophy Begins in Wonder. Hi, Kiki and Steve. How are you tonight? Wonderful. Good. 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 Um, Kiki, would you like to start us with a prayer and then we'll talk about the book? Sure. Mm -hmm. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear Lord Jesus, we come before you this evening in gratitude for the many years that Steve taught philosophy and for the last 10 years in which we've worked on bringing that classroom experience into this book. And we've We know that we have done so with your help and your grace. We ask you to bless our time this evening with Cynthia. Bless this endeavor. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, Well, I've really looked forward to uh, giving you this interview. And um, I appreciate uh, the information you've given me about the book and some of the more important points that we'll go over tonight. Um, So I guess the first question that I always start with is, what is it that brought you to write this book? Okay, what brought me to write this book is that the idea of wonder and uh, the idea that philosophy begins in wonder, which is from Plato, was brought Mm -hmm. up frequently in my classes at Fordham, especially by uh, my main professor, Dietrich von Hildebrandt, who kept referring to wonder as the beginning of philosophy, but never elaborated on it, never uh, took it further than just a few remarks. And it struck me that uh, it was very profound and true statement that philosophy begins in wonder, and also something that called for further exploration. In other words, uh, a careful analysis of precisely and specifically how philosophy does begin in wonder. And so that's what uh, I set out to do, was to spell out concretely and specifically how philosophy begins in wonder. And really the table of contents is a list of items that uh, fulfill this task of of showing uh, specifically how Plato was right when he said philosophy begins in wonder. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. So, um, so in part one, you start with uh, discussing the philosophy of the person. I'm uh, somewhat familiar with that because of uh, teaching John Paul II with the theology of the body. Um, but how do you approach that? I approach it from the point of view that our being persons is on the one hand something very familiar to us because we are persons and act as persons and think as persons, uh, love as persons and do many, many other things as persons. Mm -hmm. But most of the time, most of us simply take for granted what it is that does these things, what it is that has this ability. So for me, philosophy is largely a matter of taking the things that are familiar to us in our experience and not taking them for granted, but focusing on them and asking in a spirit of wonder, what is this? You know, uh, we talk about knowledge. What is this thing we call knowledge and how does it relate to belief and many other examples. And here in in this book, I focus on various uh, topics that uh, illustrate this. And I think one of them is our very own being as persons. So we know what we are as persons because we are persons, and yet in many ways we, we don't know because we haven't thought carefully about it. We haven't done the wonder that philosophy calls for. So that's what I attempt to do, to show in specific ways uh, what it means to be a person. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the things that got me uh, started in this, one thing that inspired me was an offhand remark by uh, my major professor at Fordham, Dietrich von Hildebrand, who in the context of of another course, not a course on the person, might have been on on, on ethics, um, made the remark 
compare to the reality of a person, this chair, he pointed to a chair next to uh, where he was teaching, uh, compare to the reality of a person, this chair doesn't even exist. Mm-hmm. And I could imagine someone saying, what do you mean the chair doesn't exist? It obviously does. You can look at it, you can see it, you can touch it, you can sit in it. But I knew exactly what he meant. He meant that mm-hmm. the chair had a certain level of reality, but mm-hmm. it was so far below the reality of what it means to be a person, the consciousness uh, that yeah. is mainly involved in being a person, that that is so much higher, you know, like a grain of sand next to Mount Everest. It's so much higher yeah. that you might mm-hmm. want to say next to Mount Everest, this grain mm-hmm. of sand doesn't even exist because it's so much smaller. So along the lines of the grain of sand next to Mount Everest, the reality of a chair is so thin and so small that we can say in order to do justice to the full reality of a person, that chair doesn't even exist. Mm -hmm. It's a good point. You know, we are certainly, um, you know, we're certainly on that unique level of having soul and body. You know, it's, so we really are above everything else that's here on earth. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting point that I think most people never get to unless someone helps point them to it. You have to be awakened to it because it's something we take for granted. We yeah. take our own existence for granted. We take the existence of other persons for granted. Uh, we take the existence of time for granted without wondering at that strange reality of what time is. Mm-hmm. Into if you want me to. But so mm-hmm. we, many things we take for granted and philosophy is for me above all the uh, not taking for granted, stepping back from this attitude of taking for granted and looking at these realities that we take for granted that are familiar to us and looking at them and seeing how wonderful they are. And I mean this Mm -hmm. now in the sense of um, enhancing wonder or inspiring wonder, wonder in that that sense, they are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And that's to me what philosophy is, is looking at those things uh, carefully and explicitly as opposed to taking them for granted. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. (coughs) excuse me i'm sorry so um in the second part you discuss uh memory and personal identity um and how the memory uh, of the person you know over time you know you're the same person even though there's all these changes and that's fascinating yeah the fascinating thing is that For the most part, when something changes very significantly, it loses its identity. Mm-hmm. Um, that, uh, in the, what, what's an it's example? The log. the log, yeah. The log mm-hmm. uh, is changed by being subjected to flame, the sure. fire. And that mm-hmm. is such a radical change when mm-hmm. it goes from log to, to ashes that you can say the log no longer, it ex- no longer exists. It loses mm-hmm. its identity as a log. The interesting thing is that with a person, no matter how radical the changes are, it's the same person. Yeah. And one example of that is from a child, a small child to an older person. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the same person. And I can look at a picture of myself as a little child and say, that's me. That's the same person. Yeah. Yeah. And also very remarkable is the, the, in the case of a, of a person who converts from evil to good. Mm-hmm. And that's remarkable. Because it's the same person. It's not that you're mm-hmm. an evil person here and a good person there as two distinct mm-hmm. persons. That is not so remarkable. But when a, a person, let's say a, a cruel Nazi guard, um, converts and becomes a saintly person, that's a remarkable thing. That this radical change doesn't take away his identity, but on the contrary, it is rooted in his identity and is the remarkable thing that it is Precisely because it's not two persons, an evil person and a good person, mm-hmm. but one and the same person who changes from being evil to being good. So that mm-hmm. this, the radical change is rooted in identity. Yeah. And I think it gives personal identity some of its, uh, or shows some of its remarkable reality, the reality of a personal identity, which we never find in nature. Mm-hmm. Here where radical changes occur, like in the log that's burned, Mm-hmm. Identity is lost. Mm-hmm. That's an interesting example, um, because when you think of a person, you know, we do die. Um, 
and yet in the resurrection, we're the same person. And that's that's fascinating because other things that go through such uh, an ex- well, actually everything that goes through such an extreme change doesn't come out at the other end the same thing. But we do, yeah. <laughs> you know, and that's that's a fascinating. In fact, uh, the meaning, what I like, like yeah. what I like to point out here is <clears throat> the very meaning of life after death, uh, the resurrection of the body and life in heaven, the very meaning of that idea of mm-hmm. uh, life after death is that I, the same person, will mm-hmm. continue after death. Yes. If it's not I, the same person, uh, then, then, it, then it's nothing. It doesn't. Yeah. I don't yeah. continue to exist as the same person. <laughs> then, then, then it's a, then it's false, and there is no mm-hmm. life after that. And right. I can only. This is another related point. I can only exist as the same person if I continue to exist. And if it's really I who continue to exist, then I exist as the same person. I cannot mm-hmm. become another person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, the log can become ashes and mm-hmm. you know various uh, physical things one thing can become uh, another that solid ice cream can become melted ice cream and floating mm-hmm. ice cream. one thing becomes another but I cannot become something which is not a person I can yeah. if I'm an evil person I can become a good person if I'm mm-hmm. an evil person I can learn something so I can change mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My identity as a person can never undergo that kind of becoming. I either continue to exist and do so as the same person, or I cease to exist, which as Christians we believe is not the case that we will continue mm-hmm. to death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, that really is something when you consider it. You know that you'll, you know, you'll not only come back, but you'll see other people. You know, and to be the same, meet yeah, the same person. I will meet my mother again, who I love mm-hmm, really, mm-hmm. the same person. Yeah, that I knew when she was. Yeah, old. yeah, it's fascinating. Right. Yeah, I mean, so mm-hmm. much of what we do relies on personal identity. I make a promise to you. Mm-hmm. I'm held responsible, assumes that I'm the same person who did something in mm-hmm. the past. Um, mm-hmm. I promise that I'll meet you next week. That assumes mm-hmm. I'll be the same person next week. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Else. Yeah. So almost yeah. everything you do assumes that personal identity exists mm-hmm. and it's there and that it continues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's really pretty advanced when you think of it, because, you know, when you're giving an example, like you gave the example of a log burning, but just to say, well, there is that tree and that tree has identity. But, you know, the identity of being a tree of whatever it is at that point in time. But our identity, even though we're always us, we're changing, you know, um, morally, you know, it, other things have nothing to do with that. Okay. The they can be a tree, but that's a it. Thin kind of identity. Yes. And, and the real yeah. identity is the identity of persons. The yes. The a pale shadow. Yes. The identity of a tree is a pale shadow. Mm-hmm. You can even get questions of whether something in a later stage is the same as an earlier. They use the example of a mm-hmm. ship where you take one plank away and replace it as another one, one plank, and it's still mm-hmm. the same ship with one plank. But if you start replacing all the planks so that at the end, none mm-hmm. of the planks are the same, it's not the question the same is ship. really, is that the same ship? And it's, mm. it's, a, it's, a lot, it's partly arbitrary. Yeah, uh, so that the, it shows that the identity of a thing like a ship is a very thin kind of identity compared mm-hmm. to the identity of a person, where that's either it's black or white, it's either the same or not. And I, I like to mm-hmm. use the example of, of being at a meeting and seeing someone in a distance, and for a moment thinking, "Is that my friend so and so, which I have whom I, whom I haven't seen in in twenty years?" Mm-hmm. And immediately, I'm aware it is either is him. Or it's not him. It's yes. someone that looks like him. Yes. I look to him and, and we start, you know, does he recognize me? Do I recognize him? And mm-hmm. we talk a little bit, and very soon it turns out, no, it wasn't the same person. Yeah. It was the same person. And he mm-hmm. has no in between. Either it was mm-hmm. the same person, or no, it turned out not to be the same person. So mm-hmm. there's a lot of things in life where we have an in-between. You know, yeah. hot, cold, and then lukewarm. Yeah. But then here you don't have, there's no such thing. As yeah. It's either the same person or it's not. Or it's not. And, mm-hmm. 
Sometimes you don't know whether it's the same thing. <laughs> I've had that happen. <laughs> I think we all have. Yeah. So uh, let's see. Um, so then you also talk um, in part three of uh, time, time, which is a fascinating thing, duration yeah. to me. St. Augustine said about time, as long as no one asks me what time is, I know what it is, meaning I know how to deal with it. But as soon as you ask me what is time, I'm lost. I'm at a loss for, for yeah. words. And there's a number of reasons for that. One of them is my, my father points out that very often we explain one thing in terms of a higher reality, we explain what a beaver is in terms of an animal. So mm-hmm. a, a smaller realm of being in, in terms of a larger one, we explain the smaller one by the larger one. But here there isn't anything. There isn't any higher reality that we can explain in terms of that. And the other is a fascinating thing that when you ask what is real about time? And mm-hmm. then you say, well, the past is gone. And a past meeting, which I missed, well, I mm-hmm. missed that. I, I can't go to it anymore. It's gone. Mm-hmm. And it's taken yeah. place and it's past and it's gone. And the future is not yet. I'm, I'm eager to vote in an election. Well, it's not going to be until November. You know, it's not mm-hmm. now. I'll wait for the future. So mm-hmm. that means only the present. The past is gone. And so in a sense, mm-hmm. it's no longer or not, doesn't exist. And the future is not yet. And so in that sense, it doesn't exist, which means that you're, that you're in the present. Mm-hmm. What is that in the present? You've got the present year. Well, a big chunk of that is gone. And mm-hmm. the part of that is not yet. Oh, the mm-hmm. year is too long. So we go to the week and the same thing. We keep shrinking it down to the present minute. And I'll skip a few of the stages in between. And even in the present minute, part of it is gone, part of it is future. Yes. Past is gone, no longer, doesn't exist. Future, not yet, doesn't exist. That mm-hmm. means it's the present. Well, how long is the present? The present is here. Here we go, now. And I say now is a couple of seconds in the past. Yeah. If you try to extend the now with a certain amount of time, you're left with the problem of some of it is gone. You know, the present tenth of a second, part of it is gone, part of it is not yet. So it can't capture the now with any extension of time. And yet mm-hmm. it is very, very real because we exist in the now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The time is very real, even though it's very hard to define it or to explain it or to, well, we can say certain things about it as I have done here. But in the end, mm-hmm. uh, it really amounts to wonder at something which is so real and yet so hard to grasp. It's also Mm -hmm. interesting because we exist in time and yet we're very uncomfortable with time. Mm -hmm. We either don't have enough of it, it goes too slow when we're in the dentist chair. Oh yeah. (laughs) When we're with somebody that we love being with. Mm -hmm. Um, So this discomfort that we have with time is a source of wonder. You know, mm-hmm. a fish isn't uncomfortable in water, but mm-hmm. we exist in this thing we call time, and yet we don't like it. We're not, we're never content with it. Mm-hmm. And we can't even find the now, you know, like students mm-hmm. say, we seem to live yeah. into the past, we live into the future. Um, it's very mm-hmm. odd that we should be so uncomfortable with time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, when we were talking about this the last time, I was thinking about it after because, of course, God does exist in the ever present. You know, He is in the now, and it's His now. It doesn't seem like His now changes. You know, because He's always ever present. God exists in the now because for yeah. us, the past is lost. Yes, we can't. You know, what's past, we can't. We can't go back to it. So mm-hmm. part of it is lost and part of it we don't have yet. So that, mm-hmm. that's an incompleteness and an imperfection mm-hmm. in our being. And that, of course, cannot apply to God. So God has to be the all-encompassing being who exists in a now, which is not really our present now. Our present now is squeezed yeah. between, the past, between the past, which is gone, and the future, which is not yet. So our, our now is a kind of thin now. Mm-hmm. Uh, squeeze between a past that's gone and a future that's not yet. So God's now is not this thin squeeze now. God's yeah. now is an eternal now. Mm-hmm. For God, nothing is lost in the past. And for mm-hmm. God, nothing 
uh, is such that he has to wait for it in the future. God exists in that total now, which in one way is so baffling to us, uh-huh. and yet is the alternative to something we also find baffling, namely our existence in time. So yeah. kind of beings that are hard to please, uh-huh. we, 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 do, we, we find the time, existence in time baffling. Mm-hmm. Well, well, that, well, we'll try an existence that's not in time, God's existence in it, in an eternal now. Well, we find that baffling also. So mm-hmm. it shows our limitations, shows that a big part of wonder is realizing how little we know and how little we understand. Mm-hmm. That's true. Mm-hmm. I think it's also good for our humility. <laughs> you know, and it really, it really does, um, it does point out to us the uh, the grandeur of God. I think because he he doesn't have any of these deficiencies. But uh, I don't know if I should call them deficiencies, but the things that we don't have. Um. Let's see. And so then you were also in part six, you talk about ethics and virtue ethics. And, and that's an interesting distinction. If you wanted yeah, to. Virtue ethics is a part of uh, ethics. There's a broad mm-hmm. field of ethics, which can be divided into conduct and character. And for many people, mm-hmm. ethics is identical with conduct. But I think that's a narrow view. Conduct mm-hmm. has to do with what should I do? Mm-hmm my promises, I should respect persons, uh, I should um, be responsible in my my job. Uh, So there's certain things I should do, and there's certain things I should tell the truth and so forth, and there's certain things I should omit, I should omit hurting other people and um, breaking promises and so forth. So Mm -hmm. um, ethics is a large part of ethics is what should I do? But in addition to the question, what should I do? There's also a question which in some ways even deeper and even more important, perhaps. What kind of a person should I be? And that Mm -hmm. refers to, well, first of all, it refers to character. What kind of Mm -hmm. character should apply to me? What kind of person should I be? And this ethics that's centered around being and character is virtue ethics. I should be a loving person. I should be a truthful person. I should be a humble person. And Mm -hmm. the two are related because... Uh, to a large extent, conduct flows from character. If I am honest as a person, if this is my part of my being, which applies to me even when I don't have an occasion to act honestly, even when I'm, you know, even when I'm asleep or mm-hmm. I'm having dinner, so whether it's not acting on honesty, I'm not particularly practicing that. <clears throat> honesty is a part of my being, and from that being flows my actions, if I'm an honest person, if that's part of my being, to the virtue ethics part, if honesty is part of my being, I will tend to act honestly. Of course, it's mm-hmm. not guaranteed. We are you know, fallen creatures and we're, we can fail. So it's not guaranteed, but the tendency will be towards being honest. Right. And so mm-hmm. you, you rely on someone uh, who is honest, you, you trust them because they're honest, and you don't rely on someone who, mm-hmm. in a corresponding way as a character trait, is dishonest. So honesty as a character trait tends towards that kind of behavior, and it's therefore valuable not only in itself, but also in its usefulness for, for conduct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's and you know, we get used to how people act, you know, a certain way, and you there are people you trust. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like one of the greatest disappointments in the world is when someone you trust or, you know, you think they're honest or whatever this case may be, yeah. and you yeah. find out they're not, you know, or that they're not in a particular that's situation. A good point. Yeah. It's so a very, it's very, very distressing yeah. situation where someone yeah. you thought was honest mm-hmm. led you to believe, you know, was not only dishonest, but deceitful about it led you to believe that and led you on and mm-hmm. invited your trust and you gave them your trust. And then in the moment, a critical moment, they're not there. They let you down. Yeah. Very, very yeah. Uh, terrible moment. Very yeah. Painful moment of, of when a person doesn't live up, doesn't act in character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Conduct, yeah. also, conduct also often comes up when I'm teaching young people ethics. 
I'll mm-hmm. say to them, you know, what does it mean to be a good person? And especially if I'm teaching, for instance, young Catholics, one of the first things they'll point to is conduct. They'll say, mm-hmm. well, you know, the Ten Commandments, don't steal, don't lie, don't kill mm-hmm. people, um, keep your promises, that kind of thing. And I'll say to them, well, so let's take a person who just sits in their house and watches TV day after day, and they never lie, and they never kill anyone, and they never do anything bad. Mm -hmm. Are they a good person? They never do anything good either. (laughs) (laughs) They just, all they do is watch television day after day and eat and Mm -hmm. sleep and watch television. So they don't do any bad conduct, any evil conduct. Mm -hmm. But neither that I went out, but are they good? You know, uh-huh. Are they good? And then they, you start to realize, well, it's more than just not doing bad. It's more yeah. than just avoiding bad conduct. Yeah. Um, that's where you start to move into virtue ethics. Uh-huh. You know, being, are you a forgiving person? Are you a generous person? Are you kind? Do you try to help people? Uh-huh. Um, and that, that points much more to what kind of a, who am I as a person, my uh-huh. character as a person. Uh-huh. Yeah, so it's both what you do and what you don't do. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, there's there's really no neutral ground ground here, is there? <laughs> a lot. I'd like to add to what Kiki says. To a large extent, what attracts you to another person and wants, uh, so that you want to make that other person your friend, is precisely their character. That they are a loving person, an honest person, mm-hmm. trustworthy person. Mm-hmm. You're generally keep your distance and your guard up when you realize that this person is not honest and yeah. trustworthy. So it seems to me that honesty and trustworthy perceived in the other person is really a foundation, foundation mm-hmm. for friendship. Mm-hmm. friendship. cannot really exist unless there's that trust and where that trust is well-founded. Uh, if, it's, if the trust is not there or the trust is there, but it's not well-founded because the other person doesn't deserve the trust, uh, the, mm-hmm. There won't be a friendship. It's going to unravel yeah. sooner yeah. or later, more, more likely sooner. Mm-hmm. It's a, it is. It's very interesting. Um, and I like that question. You know, what kind of a person should I be? You know, as opposed to just kind of floating through life. You know, what kind of person should I yeah. be? Yeah, being of a person is valuable in itself, and also from being flows doing. Mm-hmm. If I, if, I, if I have be if I have honesty as my being, then I will tend mm-hmm. to act honestly and, and all the other virtues as well. But the being has a value in itself, even even beyond it being conducive to action. So mm-hmm. it should mm-hmm. not be seen only in terms of action. It should be seen in right. terms of actions or conduct and also character. Mm-hmm. Conduct mm-hmm. and character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, you talk a little bit about forgiveness being from the will and the heart. Um, so that forgiveness piece is, is very interesting. Okay, <clears throat> forgiveness ideally should be from the heart. Mm-hmm. When you feel, uh, when you have the corresponding feeling towards the other person. Mm-hmm. But there may be cases where you are so deeply hurt mm-hmm. that your heart wants to hold on to the hurt and, and, and wants to kind of push the other person away, but you realize that you should be forgiven. And in that case, the forgiveness, um, if it's going to come at all, which it should, uh, the forgiveness will come from the will. But mm-hmm. ideally, it should be both the heart and the will. Mm-hmm. And also, when you look at it from the person, from the point of view of the person who is being forgiven, up to now I've looked at it from the point of view of the person who's doing the mm-hmm. forgiveness, from the person who is being forgiven, it's a much more, uh, much more beautiful and enriching experience when you sense that the other person uh, is coming to you, and, you know, asking for forgiveness from their heart, and not mm-hmm. only as a duty from the will. Uh, the, the will is important, but if it substitutes for the heart and takes the place of the heart and carries the weight instead of the heart, there's something incomplete about it. So it should be from both the heart and the will. Uh Uh, Same thing with love. Love should be from the heart and from the will. Uh It's the strength of love, but the heart is the real soul of love. And if you don't Uh 
a love from the heart, if it's only a will to love, it's not a full love. It's right. true love, any kind of love mm -hmm. from the heart. If you love, you love from your heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh -huh. forgiveness is, uh, I think, one of the more difficult questions that we have to deal with as people. Yeah, one way to get at it is to, to by the golden rule, mm -hmm. put yourself in the position of the other person. Yeah. I have done something wrong and ask mm -hmm. for forgiveness. I've done something wrong to you and I sincerely repent it mm -hmm. before God and before you. If I repent my wrong and ask for forgiveness, I would want to be forgiven. And so if mm -hmm. you put yourself in the position of the other person, who wants to be forgiven and even feels ought to be forgiven mm -hmm. and help you to forgive. If I mm -hmm. were in my position, I would want to be forgiven. So I do the same thing from my point of view. So if another person asks for forgiveness, I should grant the forgiveness, at least from my will, as a start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hope that the heart can come along. Sometimes we're so deeply hurt that the heart has a hard time moving along, but Hopefully, eventually, the heart will also come along. It helps mm -hmm. you to understand forgiveness as a process that takes mm -hmm. time. That time idea, you know, the time <laughs> has yeah. this connection to helping us, especially mm -hmm. when we deeply hurt. Um, and the other thing with forgiveness is often we don't really want to forgive. We hold on to not forgiving someone because they haven't said they're sorry. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's, there can be many, many reasons why a person doesn't say they're sorry. For one reason, they may not be sorry, which is the <laughs> really. or they may have died, or they may not mm -hmm. even know they hurt you. Um, they could be too shy or too embarrassed to say, I'm sorry. So there's many mm -hmm. reasons. And so sometimes we, we think, well, I have to wait to forgive for the other person to say, I'm sorry, but mm -hmm. that I'm sorry is never going to come for many mm -hmm. reasons and others. And so it's important to understand forgiveness as a power of the soul that we can forgive, initiate that forgiveness. We call it in the book, initiating forgiveness. We can initiate forgiveness without that. I'm sorry coming to us so that mm -hmm. we don't have to hold on to a hurt that the other person isn't going to say, I'm sorry for. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's an important thing to really wonder about because it, yeah. it it gives the hurt person the power back rather than waiting for another mm -hmm. person to be sorry. And in mm -hmm. and of yourself, you can initiate forgiveness mm -hmm. that you don't have to hold on to. But again, yeah. it's that process with really yeah. big hurts. <laughs> that, that's a really issue. big, <laughs> that's a really big issue. Um you know, not, and I think I may, Kiki, I know I've told you, or I believe I've told you that uh, my mother tried to abort me uh, back in 1949, chemically. And uh, she stopped because she was afraid she'd die. And then when I was 11, she told me. <laughs> you know? So it's like, I'm really, I, I'm really happy I'm a functioning human being <laughs> after going through that. But it's like, <clears throat> I often think of that idea of forgiveness. But there's no doubt in my mind, she never wanted my forgiveness. But um, there's the component that if you don't, uh, you, today the modern language is you have to come to terms with something, you know. So I think it's, it's more than coming to terms with it. Part of that coming to terms is forgiveness or even if the per you're right, even if the person doesn't want it, but it's incomplete if it's given but not accepted. And, you know, so there's always that tension. You know, I mean, I'm 71. So this is something that happened probably almost 72 years ago, right? Before I, you know, obviously before I was born and still it has that impact. So that's something, you know, when you think of it, to forgive something like that, to even try to forgive something. And I mean, I'm just using this as an example is enormous. Um, you know, the, it, hmm? one of the things we've discussed in the cat in the classroom um, mm -hmm. is 
the concept of making forgiveness person oriented rather than event oriented. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the event of what your mother did, or let's say the drunk mm -hmm. driver or whatever that kills yeah. the child. Yeah. It just is an event in the past. Forgiveness mm -hmm. doesn't undo that event. Right. Um, so right. trying mm -hmm. to make forgiveness more person oriented. I forgive the person, not the event. Mm -hmm. um, can change can help that focus sometimes because you can't all the forgiveness in the world doesn't undo the event right so um steering mm -hmm. it towards the person can, mm -hmm. can, can shift oh yeah the focus mm -hmm. from what was done to the person who did it mm -hmm. yeah and i mean certainly there are you know uh there are worse things that um that you know people who um you know, the people succeed in, in hurting someone physically or end up killing somebody, as the example you gave. It's like it's it's very, um, you know, it's that whole issue of forgiveness. And I mean, that's that's one of the great things about being Catholic. Um, apart from the call to forgive people, you know that God forgives people. So it does kind of take a little bit of the weight off you. You know, because it's like, if I don't forgive my mother, will she go to hell? Well, maybe God will forgive her, you know, but, um, and I'm sure he will. But uh, it is, you know, it's a huge issue, um, especially, I think, in a culture where so many forms of death um, are accepted, you know, euthanasia i mean what do you do if you you kill your parents one of your parents because they're sick and then you realize after gee you know i shouldn't have done that you know it's in a culture like this where life is not valuable and it really isn't um you know i don't i really don't know how that plays out easily um or well but that's forgiving ourselves is mm -hmm. another yeah 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 um that's true because we all have plenty of things to forgive ourselves for too but anyway just as it just as always the forgiveness issue, issue after i became catholic um which i did at age 38 was uh certainly a huge it's one thing to ask for forgiveness for something you've done that's difficult enough. But when you have to then ask, yeah, you know, know that you're going to try to extend forgiveness to someone who has never wanted it. That's, you know, so that, but that's part of the beauty of this religion. You know, I mean, it's like God's telling us, you know, you have to do this. <laughs> and it's not easy, but it's important. And uh, yeah. Christ gives the example. But he forgave those who crucified him. Mm -hmm. Beautiful parts of Holy Scripture when Christ yes. says, Father, forgive them. They know mm -hmm. what they do. Yeah. He was, I've often contemplated what he means by those words. They know not what they do. In some sense, they certainly did know what they do. Mm -hmm. I tend to think, and I can move towards that in a deeper sense, they didn't know what they we're doing, I think it goes in the direction of if they realize the enormity, unbelievable enormity of the evil that they were doing, mm -hmm. they might not have done it. You yeah. Just hope that. Yes. Hope that if, if we don't know that for a fact, it's hard. Yeah, to of course. Right. Consciousness, yeah. but, but there's something to be said for if they realize that. Uh, Mm -hmm. the enormity of the evil that they were doing, killing an innocent person, but that's only the beginning of it. They're killing the son of man, they're killing yeah. God himself. Yeah. I mean, how much worse can, can you get killing an innocent person? Oh, you can't get any worse. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. It's bad enough. Yeah. If you're killing yeah. the son of man, I mean, that, that just mm -hmm. goes beyond everything. And yet Christ says and gives us this beautiful example, you know, Father, forgive them. Mm hmm if Christ can forgive his those who crucified him, then mm -hmm. it shouldn't be too hard for us to forgive mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. our, our, yeah. 
Our yeah. forgiveness is a small a pale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a small thing. And, and I'd like to look at, at, at the example of Christ and say, well, if you can forgive, then mm -hmm. surely I can too. And with, with your grace, I can. And I find, I don't want to sound like I'm boasting, but I find that in that context, forgiveness is not so hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for the grace of God, do I? Um, yeah. I'll forgive them. They know not what they do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and if you go back to the there, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, we tend to assume, you know, we're the good guys and then the bad guys over there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's true. But where would I be if I had not received the love of my father and mother when I was a yeah. Where would I be if I was a child abandoned by parents and left to, you know, grow up with gangs in, in mm -hmm. the street? Uh, who knows? Who knows where I would be? I can't claim to know that I would be. No. Yeah. Um, you know, we are fortunate, and that I can't go enough in that phrase there, but for the grace of God, go I. We are what we are through God's grace. And I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. feel that very, very deeply because I have experienced God's grace directly and through the people in my life, first my father and mother, and then people now, my wife and Kiki. Uh, they are the, the grace of those people and God's grace directly have made me the person that I am. Mm -hmm. so if there's something good about me, and I hope there is, it's all because of the grace of God. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, let's see. You also discuss uh, gratitude in the book uh, when you're dealing with uh, the in virtue ethics, and I guess that's kind of what you're talking about now when you're saying, you know, that you can look and see the other people that were in your life and the wonderful things that they did. Um, you know, um, so it's, uh, I don't know if there's anything else you, you wanted to say about that, but I, I think gratitude is important too. Gratitude on, on um, yeah, the upright cup. Um, gratitude can be a kind of a basic disposition where we do not take for granted the good things of life that we mm -hmm. have friends that love us, that support us, that we have enough to eat, that we have a home, mm -hmm. that we live on a peaceful street and not in a war zone. Uh, yeah. We're able to, to walk. <laughs> you know, that, that, that when I parallel, every time I see a person in a wheelchair, I'm grateful that I can walk. It's mm -hmm. easy to take that for granted. Oh, of course yeah. I can walk. I can get up and walk. Well, no, you can't, don't take that for granted because some people cannot do that. They very difficult for them to get around. So uh, gratitude can be uh, an antidote to taking for granted. And there's also a wonderful example that my father uses where he speaks of gratitude, not just as a, a specific response to someone who loves me and grateful mm -hmm. for their love who has favored me and I'm grateful for the favor, but also as a basic uh, disposition that gratitude places me in the where I can receive. And if I lack gratitude, I will fall into um, complaining. And I often refer to my time in the army when the other soldiers were complaining and complaining and complaining. And I said, let's be grateful that when we go out in the field and we have these exercises, it's all pretend. It's yeah. not really the real bullets that are coming at yeah. you. Be grateful that it's not a real war. Be grateful for the food you turn out. Be grateful for your friend. And my father uses a good, good analogy here, the upright cup. And he says that by being grateful, we can receive. And if we are ungrateful, even though many favors are given to us, we will not receive. And mm -hmm. he says that to a cup. If a cup is lying on its side, you can have all the rain. And all yeah. The cup will not get any water. Right. So you're going to have a thunderstorm of rain and drenching rain. The cup is lying on its side. Mm -hmm. Nothing will happen. The cup has to be mm -hmm. upright. And if mm -hmm. it's in the upright position, then after a short period of time of rain, the cup will be full. Mm -hmm. and the rain represents the good things of life. Yeah. And our being upright represents our being grateful as a disposition to receive. 
Mm-hmm. To receive the love of another person, to receive the good things of life that we see from God, to receive from other persons. So by being grateful, I am like an upright cup and I can receive. Mm-hmm. Not grateful, then I can have all the favors in the world. I'm lying on my side and the favors and all of yeah. can come down and nothing will come. Into yeah. Me. That's 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 a really that's a good image. The beautiful image that captures the reality of gratitude as placing me in the position where I can truly receive. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yes, the question: Can an unhappy person, an ungrateful person, be happy? Mm -hmm. Probably, probably not real happy. (laughs) Yeah, at least an ungrateful, an unhappy person who is complaining. Yeah, complaining rules out, keeps out. It's like a barrier that keeps out happiness. And complaining is precisely the antithesis to gratitude as this upright cup. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, Let's see. And then in the last part of the book, you talk about um, Pascal's wager, Pascal's wager and the importance of seeking God. Okay. Um, That divides as follows. For some people, faith in God is easy. It's given to them. They they know God exists from the experiences in their life. And other people find it more difficult. And one reason a person might find it difficult is they see evil in the world. Mm -hmm. And they ask, you know, what is God who has all all power? To allow the evil, and so they, they're not sure about whether God exists. And Pascal, I think, went through that kind of uh, doubt about God, and he even expresses it, uh, you know, succinctly. He says he wants to believe, and part of him believes and part of him doesn't, and he expresses it by saying, seeing too much <clears throat> to deny God, but not enough to be sure and some contrary evidence, which also goes against being sure, I'm in a state to be pitied. And then he goes from there, my heart inclines to know, and my, my heart inclines to know uh, entirely where is God and is God real and may God come into my life. So from that moment of doubt comes this earnest seeking of God, uh, an openness to God or God, if you exist, enlighten my soul with the knowledge of your existence. So that's mm-hmm. a Pascalian way. If you doubt, at least seek. You yeah. can go so far, very strong language. The doubter who does not seek is altogether miserable and wrong. Mm-hmm. Mistaken and, and miserable. And I think he's right. It's very strong mm-hmm. language. And yeah. I didn't dare to use that language, but he does. So I'll quote him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to my friends who don't believe, I ask them, are you sure there's no God? No, you can't be sure. They're most they're more likely to be agnostics than atheists. You can't be sure there's no God. If you want to emphasize, well, are you sure there is a God? Okay. Mm-hmm. Moments of doubt. But you can't be sure there's no God. And so if that's up in the air, follow Pascal. Seek God. It's better to say, and there comes the way mm-hmm. I like to formulate it. It's better to seek God. When in fact there is no God, when the atheist was right after all, you haven't really lost anything. Better to seek God when there is no God than not to seek when there is a God. And you can give a a human image of that. If a child is missing, you go and you seek, try to find that child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five year old child is missing. And if you go out and seek to find that child, you may find that child, you may not, but at least you've tried. At least you've tried. What is really tragic is if that child actually wasn't all that far away. The kidnapped you know, mm-hmm. panic and dropped the child. And if you just go a little bit further, walk a little bit further, you would have found the child. Yeah. So the real tragedy is that is to, the God is there, but you don't see it. And I put that as a diagonal that God is, God is not. I believe God or I seek God on the lower left, and I do not believe God on the lower right. So God, if a God exists, I should believe in him. If it doesn't exist, I shouldn't believe in him. And there's two ways of going wrong, which are the diagonals. And while it's unfortunate if you 
believe in God and then there was no God, but you really haven't lost that much. The real tragedy is you don't believe that there was a God. Yeah. And I'm, not, I'm not one of those who say all oh, unbelievers go to hell. I don't make that judgment. No. The judgment is left to God and they come mm-hmm. mercy on unbelievers and they mm-hmm. have mercy on me. But I don't want to be in the position, you know, I feel responsible for my own. I don't want to be in the position that when I die, I appear before God and he says to me, why did you deny me? That's a bad position to be in. Yep. So I'll take my chances. I will believe in God. And then if, the, if it turns out the atheist is right, I will never find that out. <laughs> if the atheist is right, there's no God, no life after death, then I die and there's no consciousness. Right. <laughs> there's nothing. Yeah. Um, but so my position, if the atheist is right, is not so tragic. It's not so terrible. I just won't exist. But the atheist who finds out, oh my God, God did exist after all, and I was wrong on this all-important question. That's a pretty painful position to be in. And God, when I ask me, give an account of your life. Give an account of your life. Why did you deny me? Or if you weren't sure that I existed, if you thought there were reasons not to, why did you not at least seek? And that's, that's the Pascalian message. The doubter who does not seek is altogether miserable, and mistaken, mm-hmm. he's wrong, and yeah. he's also mistaken. And I think, I think Pascal is right. And Pascal's wager, as I put in the diagonals, captures that. Uh, if there's no God, and I have been seeking my life, I haven't really lost anything. But woe to me in the other direction. And I don't seek, and there was after all a God. And I think in the end, if, if you really push the thing, the atheist cannot say, I know there's no God. No. He has to be an I think ultimately the atheist has to be pushed to an agnostic position. And if you push to an agnostic position, then the question arises which way of going wrong is worse. And to me, it's so clear that to go wrong by not believing when God does exist is so much worse than mm-hmm. believe and then God did exist after all. Okay, I was wrong. I tried. You know, I tried to do the best I could. and Mm-hmm. Okay. They're more more than trying your best, you can't do. Yeah. Try my utmost. And that's really what I say. I do your utmost. Mm-hmm. Your utmost to seek God. And if he does exist, he will embrace you. And if there's no God, well, at least you tried. Mm-hmm. One of the, the threads that runs through the entire one wonder book is that we should always be trying to seek to have the right response, the value response to things, mm-hmm. value response to persons, to the world, to the environment, and certainly to God. Um, so that concept of having the right response is there throughout philosophy, mm-hmm. the right response to truth. Um, so that's what we're always seeking when we sure. wonder about philosophy is finding the right response to many different things. Mm-hmm. God, of course, being the ultimate. Yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's whether this is it, you know, or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's certainly um, an interesting book, and it's uh, got a lot of things that people can think about, and you presented them in a way that I think will make people think. Um, So... But I suppose a great deal of that is because you're a great teacher. And I I can tell that just by listening to you. (laughs) Part of it is that I've always loved teaching. Mm -hmm. Going way back, I had no doubt as to what my life career would be, would be teaching philosophy, because I love Mm -hmm. philosophy and I love teaching and they go together. Mm -hmm. So I look forward to teaching and went into it with great joy and has always been a Tremendous source of deep happiness uh, to be able to mm-hmm. teach and share, share yeah. the truth with students and have yeah. students like Kiki. <laughs> Steve's mm-hmm. class was one of the first I took when I was at URI in 19. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. We've been friends ever since. It was mm-hmm. just a great experience. He's a wonderful teacher. Um, we've really tried to bring 
some of the joy that he created in the classroom. We've tried to bring that into the book as best mm-hmm. possible. There's nothing like the classroom experience, um, mm-hmm. but we have tried to really help people think for themselves in the book, point out different ways of thinking about things. Mm-hmm. Um, and direct that, but leave it in the end up to the reader to mm-hmm. come to their own conclusions. And, and mm-hmm. so Steve's done a great job. Yeah, and you are joy filled. <laughs> you know, you know, you really have that um, uh, personality. I guess I would say, or that personality trait. You're you're a happy, uplifting, joyful person. <laughs> Someone who loves people and loves to share good things with people. Mm -hmm. I considered my teaching is sharing good things that I perceive, sharing the truth with people. Mm -hmm. Joy of finding response, responsive people in in at least many students. And some of them, many came forward and some didn't come forward. But I'd like to think that even those who didn't, that a seed was planted and Mm -hmm. took a while to germinate. And later in life, they will look back on their experience of the, the classroom experience with me and the, mm-hmm. will, the seed will bear fruit. Good, good. Well, that's, that's uh, to me, that would be the perfect vocation slash career. Yeah, well, yeah. it's a great blessing to have that as a career. Mm-hmm. To earn my living doing that. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, Go to work and have fun every and day and get paid. <laughs> uh, you know, or do some other tedious thing. I get paid for doing something that I mm-hmm. deeply love and that is deeply fulfilling, that is deeply valuable, and you also mm-hmm. get paid for this. Hey, that's <laughs> That's great. Read that. That's great. You know, so I consider myself extremely blessed mm-hmm. in having that career and getting the job at the University of Rhode Island through wonderful, wonderful good. circumstances. I was given the job at URI, mm-hmm. and then I had wonderful students like Kiki. And mm-hmm. that's good. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to thank both of you for the interview. Um, I've certainly enjoyed it. It's uh, very interesting material, and I think that people that read the book will really get something out of it. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Kiki, would you like to close us in prayer? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for our conversations, our friendship and the ability to reach out to others in this way. We thank Cynthia. We ask you to bless her and her family, bless Steve, and um, just to help us to go forward in that spirit of wonder and gratitude. Amen. Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Again, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Oh, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.